So I'm Reverend Philip Newman, one of the ministers that serves the congregation, and hello comes from not just me, but from my colleague, Reverend Simon Lesseur, uh, our minister of music, Gerald Van Wyke, and our amazing choir who brings their gift of music uh, this morning. And uh, we just want to welcome you and invite you to settle in and to en enjoy and participate this uh, service, which is uh, today, uh, Transfiguration Sunday. And it's, uh, it's a day that has uh, unusual stories associated with it. It really calls for our imagination, I think. And uh, you might just invite God to help you in your imagination as we move through Transfiguration Sunday, a, a day which brings to a close the season uh, of Epiphany. Now, uh, for those looking for assistance uh, with kids, uh, for three and under, our nursery is available. A nusher can help direct you uh, to where it is located. And of course, our Sunday club is available for four and older, and uh, Simon will be inviting you to move there in just uh, a little bit. But after worship, uh, one of our traditions is to continue our conversations in our church hall. Uh, at, you'll be, uh, you'll find your way easily using this uh, exit here at the front left. And uh, in our church hall, there's always uh, 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 beverages available for you, and there's always good conversation and friendships to uh, catch up on as well. There's special goodies there awaiting us today. Uh, so, uh, a few announcements on Wednesday: our community lunch uh, is being held in our church hall. And uh, really helpful topics for, for that day being presented as well as the lunch. Uh, strategies on security and uh, protection uh, and uh, fraud in the community. And so full information is in print. And we invite you to be sure that you're inviting others to join in uh, that lunch on this Wednesday here in the church hall. Uh, Wednesday uh, is also Ash Wednesday, because today ends the season of Epiphany. We begin the season of, of Lent on Wednesday, and you might just want to come a little earlier if you're coming to the community lunch. Ash Wednesday service will be at 10 o'clock, and it will be held in our chapel, and there we will um, observe communion together, uh, ashes, which are a, a traditional part of Ash Wednesday as as we really launch ourselves into the spiritual journey of Lent over the next number of weeks, making our way toward Holy Week uh, and Easter. And uh, we are making available to uh, anyone who wants uh, some Christian practices through the season of Lent. Uh, first of all, you will find uh, a number of inserts in your bulletin this morning. One of them is, has a prayer to begin the day and on the reverse side a prayer to end the day. Uh, that is uh, for you to use any day, really, that you might like. But we're really inviting you through the season of Lent to make use of that uh, as you're able to. Uh, we've done this before. Some people keep the, uh, the prayer sheet uh, on a bedside table, and so it's right there for first thing in the morning. At the end of the day, some put it near their table where they're going to have breakfast, maybe where they close the day. So it is there just to help strengthen us. Uh, and it's rather amazing to know that we all might be sharing the same words in prayer through that season as we begin and end each day. Uh, as well, uh, starting next Sunday after worship, after the musical postlude, uh, Simon and I are offering three Christian practices that are easy practices to do or to participate in. And again, it's optional. And it, again, that'll take place in our chapel after service. Um, we're offering each of the Sundays through March uh, Holy Communion, if you would like that, if you would find that helpful for your spiritual journey. Uh, we're offering the opportunity to have prayer one-on-one uh, -on -one with Simon or I or someone else who might be there. And uh, you might also just wish to simply light a candle uh, for your own strengthening in the season of Lent. Or as you're thinking of someone else who uh, you are supporting through your own quiet prayers uh, on an ongoing way. So 
we'll say more about that and remind you next Sunday as well. And uh, it's just a way to enrich the journey of Lent. Uh, speaking of enriching journeys, uh, we have the opportunity to get to know a bit about our Squamish neighbors a bit more. On March the 7th, there's an invitation uh, gathering being organized to join in with the people of the Squamish Nation Shaker Church, which is just not far away on the Capilano Reserve. There's a sign-up sheet required. I have information that I would need to share with you just to help prepare you for that. It begins with a teaching time together and followed by a, a, a service uh, that they would offer that we're all welcome to be part of. Sign up at the welcome table for that. Coming up as well in March is our annual general meeting, and uh, it takes place after worship on that Sunday, and Debbie Baxter is really needing your help. Debbie, stand up and wave so folks know who they need to get to. Debbie's helping to organize the lunch after, and she's not prepared to make it all herself, I'm told, and, although she's a great cook, I must say. Uh, but uh, she's looking to all of us to help with that. So uh, there's a sign-up sheet uh, at the welcome table, and Debbie will be at the welcome table that you can let her know how uh, you might be able to help uh, for that coming Sunday. There's also now limited quantity of printed reports for the annual meeting available at the welcome table today. Not yet enough for e everyone, but there are some limited uh, numbers there. Uh, you continue to add stories, and wonderful they are, to the uh, uh, Acts of Kindness uh, bulletin board. If you have stopped by, uh, just to check it out, there's a, just a wonderful array of things you are being attentive to. Some of you have been the ones offering an act of kindness. Some of you have been recipients of the kindness. Some of you have simply observed uh, the kindnesses. Uh, which is great for us to be doing and observing through the month of uh, February, which is Kindness Month. Just one that really caught my attention. Uh, the story goes something like this. An older uh, woman was trying to cross Lonsdale at a red light. You know what that could be like. It was obvious she was walking slowly, too slowly for the lights. And so I hopped out of my car uh, which was stopped at the red light to help her. And as the light turned green, not one other car at that intersection moved until I got her to the sidewalk and then walked back to my car at that intersection. So that's just a wonderful piece of cooperative kindness that happened just in a flash, spontaneously. Let us continue to be aware of those kindnesses and certainly continue through the rest of the month of February which is through this week, to add your stories to the bulletin board just on the other side of this wall. Uh, we have a concert coming up on, uh, in April. It is a fundraiser supporting our refugee sponsorship efforts. Uh, we really need uh, you to help uh, pass the word around. We really want the ticket sales to soar, and uh, you are the ones that can help with that. There's a lot of things taking place, and I'm going to invite Katie to come forward, who's going to tell us about one of the other inserts in the bulletin that's called Kids Stuff Swap. What's that about, Katie? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so you'll see this snappy flyer that Megan designed. So Megan and I are organizing a uh, new event for this spring called the Kids Stuff Swap. So we're working in cooperation with the flea market. Uh, this event is designed so that people can rent a table in the gym to sell their used, any kids related items. So whether that's baby stuff or little kids or big kids. So the idea is that people will have a chance to clear out their things and come sell it to a crowd. So the flea market will have their children's department selling um, some of their stuff in a section in the gym. And then there will be opportunity at the end if anyone hasn't sold their items and would like to donate them to the flea market, they will be welcome to do so, but obviously not required. Um, so we're hoping that we will be able to draw a new crowd of people uh, just into the gym that day. It's another touch point for our community. And as a young mom, I am overrun with things and thought that other people might feel the same way. 
Um, I know a lot of you are not in uh, my life stage where you have the little kids things, but I'm sure you know people, uh, maybe your grandkids' families have things that they would like to sell. Um, so if you have any questions, please do come talk to me or to Megan. Um, and you can please feel free to pass these along to anyone in your community that might find it helpful. If they don't want to come sell things, but they would like to shop, uh, April 4th from 10 till 2, admission will be free and they're welcome to come shop and find some good deals. Thank you, Katie. And uh, John Mendez is the chairperson of our refugee support team. And he's going to bring us some latest updates and uh, some exciting new developments, John. Thank you, uh, Philip. We planned this up a while ago, but the timing is quite good, as I'll relate in a moment. So thank you for this opportunity to update everyone here on how our team is doing. Uh, and I'd like to begin by just acknowledging that uh, today we have uh, Ali and Biravan with us today. If they could just stand for a moment so we can all see you. Thank you, Ali and Biravan. Ali and Biravan um, were the family that we gathered together in 2015, the beginning of our journey uh, with the refugee uh, uh, mission. And, and uh, they arrived in, in, in March of 2017, having spent around four years in a refugee camp in, in northern Iraq. And Biravan has asked that I pass along a message from her and Ali to, to everyone here, and I'm just gonna read it out to you. She, she uh, writes, first of all, I want to say it's our pleasure being with you today, and thank you for inviting us. So far, our, our life in Canada is going really good, Ali is happy where he works, the kids are enjoying their school, and I am also going to school. I'm happy that I can learn the language. My mother-in-law talks to us every day and I feel the joy in her voice. She's really happy that she will, she will uh, meet us, meet her grandchildren, her son, even though they have faced injustice, but at least they will forget it a little bit when they come here and meet with us also be in a safe country with wonderful people. Lastly, I wish you all a peaceful life and we will never forget what you all did for us. Now, as Biravan mentions in her message, today our committee is working on sponsoring her mother-in-law, Ali, Ali's mom and Ali's sister and Ali's cousin and his family of four they too are currently in that same refugee camp where they have been for over six years. And they've endured a lot of hardships in their time there. They've had to endure uh, temperatures that go all the way from, from snow in the winter in makeshift uh, shelters to temperatures that can reach 50 degrees Celsius. They've endured deprivation. I, I read just this week that in the area in which they are, where, where they're living in the northern part of Iraq, the, um, the unemployment rate among Kurds, and they're all from the Kurdish uh, part of, uh, uh, of Syria, the unemployment rate is 37% and the poverty rate is 47%, very high and, and depressing numbers. They've had to endure fear there, of course. That part of uh, Iraq, like a lot of that part of the world, is an area where ISIS has spread its terror over the past several years. And of course, they've had to endure despair the despair of not knowing whether they're going to live out their days in a refugee camp or maybe even return home to a country that, if you've been following the news, since December, since December, 700,000 people have, have left their homes because of continuing fighting. Um, the population of Vancouver is about that, the city of Vancouver, just to give you an idea of the scale of human suffering there. So we responded to that despair with the compassion that is at the heart of our faith as Christians. And I'm pleased to say that, that uh, very recently we received news that our efforts are about to bear fruit. We got uh, news this week that Ali's cousin and his family of four, uh, two boys ages 10 and 14, are going to arrive in a month to two months. Catching us all a little bit by surprise. <laughs> 
we, uh, we're expecting some time toward the end of the year. Anyway, it's great news. So we're all going to spring into action. And if you'd like to spring into action with us, there's three ways that you can, you can do that. Of course, you can volunteer your time and by, by, by helping us out and getting, getting furniture and household goods and all those things that need, need to happen, happen. And I, if I could, I'd just like to ask our, our team to just stand so that people know who they can contact if they want to, to, uh, to help out. If you could just stand, please, so people know who you are. So if you contact any of us, if you're interested in getting involved, contact any of us and let us know. Thank you. Likewise, there's a great need for money uh, to make this happen. Uh, there are some yellow envelopes, I understand, maybe not a lot. If there isn't a yellow envelope and you do want to donate, just speak to one of our team members and we'll get a yellow envelope for you. And then lastly, we have this concert coming up on April 3. The great Marcus Mosley and the Sojourners singing songs from their la latest album. Uh, Freedom Never Dies, great title. I think it really captures what, what this uh, movement is about. Please come join us on April 3. It's a Friday. Gail Lowe will be selling tickets um, outside. We hope you can join us. And uh, what a great way to spend a Friday. You can listen to some great music and bring hope to people halfway across the world. breath and settle in. It's so great uh, being part of a community of faith in which there is so much happening. Now a few, uh, a few months ago, um, you may have heard uh, his name mentioned in the hallways. Um, it's always exciting when uh, someone new uh, uh, shows up and, and jumps in with both feet, and I think within a week, um, Dan was involved in helping put up the flea market tent, and was involved, uh, checked out some of the Bible studies, and um, I mean, both him and his girlfriend Lou uh, just really jumped in. Um, they recently moved to West Vancouver, and, um, and Dan's mom had told him that, just look for a church community, that's a great place to start getting to know people, and, uh, and getting to know people they have. And so um, uh, Lou uh, is just studying right now at UBC to become a nurse, and that's coming to, uh, coming to a, a, an end soon, I believe. Okay, not really. <laughs> so a ways to go. Um, and Dan, um, Dan just uh, finished, graduated with a degree in, in uh, computer software and is just trying to figure out um, kind of what's next before he spends the rest of his life in front of a screen. Um, so they just returned recently from a bike trip to uh, down in California and then uh, Dan explored the, the wilderness of South Africa and Lesotho. And uh, so I'd love to invite both of you, uh, Dan and Lou, to come and light the Christ candle for us um, as a reminder of Christ's presence in the world. Please join with me in the call to worship. The Lord be with you. As a light shining in a darkened place, the day dawns. When we still our thoughts, we hear God's voice. The day is new. Come, let us worship.
to be here with you, Holy One, and grant us peace to center our busy minds, and grant us grace to cleanse our burdened hearts. We have good intentions, O oh God. We like to think we understand what you want, but end up doing what we want instead. We have grand ideas, but neglect to include you in our plan. And so we stay put. We choose safety rather than the risk of following where you lead. Pardon our tendency to remain fixed in our ways. Forgive us and embolden us to follow wherever you lead. We pray in Jesus' name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to stand as we proclaim together an old, old uh, statement of faith. The letter begins, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. to invite the kids and teens up front so we can uh, pray with you before uh, you 
head off to Sunday Club. before you head off to Sunday Club. God, I just thank you so much um, for these amazing young lives. God, thank you for their energy, um, and thank you for Mimi and Dylan and um, for, for all the, the work that they do in, um, in teaching them to follow you, Jesus. God, may you bless them with your spirit and uh, keep guiding them. We ask all of this in Jesus' awesome and holy name. Amen. All right, off we go to Sunday Club. Let us pray. Oh God, we praise you and thank you for your loving kindness and mercy, which is new every morning and remains steadfast and sure throughout the day. We come to you today deeply grateful for your creation. As we look around us, we are amazed at the greatness and majesty of all that you have made. Nature reflects your greatness, the vast expanse of the sky, the mountains, the ocean, trees, lakes, and streams all speak of your great design. May we show our love and reverence to you by caring for all that you have created. Holy God, when our world trembles and quakes, when plagues take over and when droughts and wildfires wreak havoc on ecosystems, we come to you in prayer. We continue our prayers for all countries still experiencing drought and unrest. We pray also for the more than 2,000 people who have died from the coronavirus and the approximately 75,000 who are infected. When we are tempted to turn away from your people and find new reasons to discriminate against one group or another, remind us that pointing a finger at anyone based on their ethnicity is wrong and that before you, all people are holy. As we pray for justice and peace, we lift up our own country, Canada, and pray that because of the blockades that, we have been, that, that have been erected by First Nations communities who feel threatened by the use of their hereditary lands, we pray that cooler heads will prevail in negotiations with little or no violence. Help us to heal those who are broken in body or in spirit. Our bodies can be so fragile and when they are physically attacked, difficulties and fears arise. We pray today for these people. Colt, Craig, Ingles, and Bernie, Brian, Kaylee, and Georgia. Jill, Alistair, Terry, Amanda, Bradford, Alexandra, Catherine, Victoria, and Ryan, Carol, Roman, and Milton, and Ross. Please draw them closer to you, in Jesus' name. 
Dear God, may our prayers manifest into actions that guide us toward your will. Send your Holy Spirit's blessing to each one of us and all of your good creatures. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I need to share this story with you. I won't use any names be, uh, out of respect for this family's story. This family I met last Sunday afternoon after they had uh, arranged uh, to meet with me. They are not able to be in worship because they live way out the valley. But in the midst of the dad, uh, the husband being caught up in anxiety and in depression, reached out by turning to the uh, computer and Googling uh, online services. It's not even sure how he came up with that search. He grew up as a Sikh, uh, as did the rest of his family. And top of the list was the online service here at West Vancouver United Church. And last fall, he began watching the online services. And over that time, excuse me, <clears throat> over that time, his anxiety has begun to lift, and his depression has begun to lift as well. And it's helping, of course, not only him, but his whole family of four, his spouse, his two kids are benefiting as a healthier family, as dad and husband is resting far more in the sense that there is a God who is embracing him and carrying him through. They're not likely able to ever be here on a Sunday morning because of the distance. 
but he wanted to stand in this sanctuary last Sunday afternoon and to see the space he sees online and to have prayer together and to offer himself, really, uh, to God's care. And so we did that. That's just one of the amazing gifts that your gifts offer to the community around. We just never know where that, how that help is received, where it comes from, and how it is lived out. But I want to say to you, well done for offering that gift to the community, far and wide. And so, friends, let our offerings be received this morning.
haven't seen our scripture reader yet this morning, and so it's me. <laughs> so friends, let's pray. Holy One, as we prepare to hear your word, may you prepare our hearts and our imaginations to receive your story. Amen. So this is a reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with them. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here, if you wish. I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God.
vacation. It was to be a camping vacation, and so being towed behind my father's car was a camper trailer. And uh, for some reason that I've long since forgotten, uh, we got a terribly late start on that first day of vacation. And as the sun set, I remember the evening grew growing really dark, that fog arrived. It was thin at first, but then as we grew sleepy, I remember our family car barely crawling down the highway in search of a place to camp for the night. And the cloud was just absolutely disorienting. After searching, my dad found a sign directing campers to an overflow camping area. And we could make out no shapes of anything, no landmarks whatsoever, but he found a space to stop, and through the thick darkness that enveloped us, we crawled into our camp beds, exhausted and slept, and waited for the cloud to release us, which it eventually did. But before we go on to explore this gospel story, let's pray. Oh Lord, May I never lightly presume to speak your word, nor may we ever lightly presume to hear your word, for in your word is life. Amen. As I considered uh, the curious scene that's assigned for Transfiguration Sunday, a cloud, uh, a bright, dazzling light, a voice, and then everyone focused on that spectacle, it occurred to me that whenever you come up on something about God or something about the life of faith that everyone just agrees is true and helpful, then just step back from that focus. Step back from that adoring crowd whose gaze is fixed on that something, in the case of today's story, it's that cloud that has caught the attention of that small crowd of people there. Step back and then look in the opposite direction because nine times out of ten, there is something just as true going on back there. Though largely ignored because its benefits are less obvious and its truth a little harder to embrace. So, for example, um, God is light, and in God there is no darkness at all. Our opening hymn uh, reflects that belief. How good, Lord, uh, to be here. Your glory fills the night. Your face in garments like the sun shine with unborrowed light. And then our second hymn, shine, Jesus, shine. Lord, the light of your love is shining. Shine on me. And it continued into our third hymn that we sung. Here in this place, new light is streaming. Now is the darkness vanished away. Here in this place, a new light. And then in our closing hymns, which we'll soon sing, we get to sing clothed in light upon the mountain, shining in eternal glory. Jerry, it's almost like you've got a theme running through <laughs> these hymn selections this morning. I mean, it would seem to me that we are people who believe that God is light. That in God, light is to be found. That light is in God. That light characterizes God. That light wins over darkness. That God's love pours light into the world. And I'm not saying it's not true. How could I? I mean, the Psalms themselves are also full of that image that we all embrace the Lord's my light and my salvation, the foundation of life in whose light we see light. Our favorite passages are full of that same affirmation. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. And John's gospel has light all through it. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I mean, what's not to love about that image that we embrace? The benefits of leaning into these passages are so clear. So clear that you really have to have a sack over your head to miss them. 
The light of the world has come to put an end to darkness, to be a lamp in the hands of those who believe. Uh, I know so many people whose lives just depend on that good news when they can't see where they're going, when the bottom drops out, when their prayers seem to go unanswered and they're marooned in a kind of darkness. That makes them afraid to move. They, they know that if they can just keep their minds focused on the light of the world, then sooner or later he will send some bright angel to get them out of there. Light. Light, it is by far the most popular Christian truth embraced. But if you turn around and you look behind you, there's an equal and opposite truth that gets little airtime, I think, in, in church, though it is well attested to in Scripture. And I would say, looking in the opposite direction, it is that God dwells in deep darkness. God comes to people in dark clouds and dark nights, in dark dreams and dark strangers, and in ways that sometimes scare them half to death, but almost always for their good, or at least for their renovation. God does some of God's best work in the dark. And if this is hard to see, then maybe it's because we've been conditioned to think of darkness as negative. When I listen uh, to all the ways that, uh, that people use dark in ordinary conversations these days, I mean, it seems clear that the, the word has become a, a grab bag for everything sinister, dismal, and tragic, and wrong. Just think of the phrases you hear, that was a really dark film. Or this economy's not out of the dark yet. Well, she's in a dark mood. I'm sorry, I'm just in a dark place right now. And him, oh well, he's gone over to the dark side. Not you, Jerry. He's gone over to the dark side. Um, the only positive associations with darkness that I've heard with any regularity, regularity is dark chocolate and dark beer. <laughs> Maybe you can help me lengthen that list uh, later. But for now, it, it may be enough to say that no one, no one asks God, for more darkness, please. Please, God, come to me in a dark cloud. Give me a dark vision. Um, put out my light so that I can see what I need to see. And then send in a dark angel on the worst night of my life, please. I mean, as far as I can tell, no one asks for that. No one asks for that in the Bible either. But you know it happens. God comes to Abraham in the dark. After telling the old man to sacrifice a whole list of things, a heifer, a goat, a ram, a turtle dove, a pigeon, and then he lays them out on the ground kind of like a runway for a divine landing. And, and God comes to him as a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch and passes between these creatures all neatly lined up to seal a covenant that he's making with Abraham. And I, uh, God comes to Jacob in the dark, not once, but twice. The first time it's a dream at the foot of a heavenly ladder, and the second time it's on a river bank, where a man who isn't quite a man, a mysterious figure, fights with him all night long, and morning light puts an end to it, but before the man goes, he leaves, uh, he gives uh, Jacob a name. And, uh, and a blessing, and then leaves him with a permanent limp in his hip. Yeah, I guess that's the gift that just keeps on giving. Uh, for those who think God goes easy on God's chosen ones, why don't you start noticing how many things happen at night in the Bible? The list just grows fast. Uh, Jacob's son Joseph dreams such dreams at night, uh, such dreams that he he catches the attention of a pharaoh, graduates from a dungeon into the palace in order to become the royal interpreter of dreams. The exodus from Egypt, it happens at night. God parts the Red Sea at night. 
Manna falls from the sky in the wilderness at night. And that's just the beginning. One of the heaviest mm, clusters of darkness in the early books of the Bible um, has nothing to do with nighttime, however. It comes about three moons into the wilderness story when the people who escaped Egypt are camped at the foot of Mount Sinai. And that's where God decides to enter into the covenant with the people, the Bible says, to marry them in the full light of day with Moses as the celebrant. I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud, says God to Moses. Sound familiar? In order that the people may hear when I speak to you and so trust you ever after. And that's how it happens. God comes in a cloud, speaks to the people from inside it. The cloud sits on Sinai for days, flashing like there's a forest fire going on inside of it. When God calls Moses to come inside, Moses enters and he stays for 40 days. And when he comes out again, oh, his skin, we're told, is so shiny that people are afraid to come near him. Even to look at him is dangerous. And so Moses fashions a kind of shield, that he, a uh, veil that he can pull down when he's not with God and with the people only to protect the people from seeing too much of God's glory all at once. Uh, the cloud and the glory, they go together. Not just then, but I think always. I think that's a truth about God, that few are eager to embrace. I think we just need to ask someone like Job who yelled into the darkness for 37 entire chapters of his story before God snatched him up into a whirlwind and showed him things just too wonderful for him to see. Ask Peter and James and John who entered a cloud in today's gospel text on another mountain where they too were overshadowed by the glorious, terrifying darkness of God Ask Saul, that ferocious know-it-all who was blinded on the road, thrust into darkness, so he could be led by the hand uh, to a hard bed in a rented room where he finally became soft enough to welcome a dark angel named Ananias. It was on Christmas 1984 that I slid into the terrifying darkness of a cloud of depression. It was the end of my second year of ministry, and I was burned out. I was just toast. And the Christmas lights did not twinkle for me that Christmas, nor over the next, the coming year. As I gradually, in that dark cloud, began to release to God this thing called ministry, as I knew it, it was not mine to be grasped and held on to. I was not the one to save the world as I had thought. That was God's job. And somehow in the darkness, I needed to get clear on that. My job was to serve and to love. And as I grew in that understanding, the darkness of that cloud began to clear. It's not a popular truth, but there it is. God dwells in deep darkness. The darkness that is not dark to God. It can be terrifying for those, for those of us who like our deities, prefer our deities to be well lit. And when we cannot see, and when we're not sure, where we're going, and all the old landmarks have vanished inside a cloud, then plenty of us can believe that we are lost. When the exact opposite, I think, may be true. Based on the witness of those who have gone before, the dark cloud is where God takes people apart so they can be made new. It's the cloud of unknowing, uh, 
where nothing you thought you knew about God can prepare you to meet the God who is. It is the, it is the dark womb, I think, where life begins again. Maybe that's where Nicodemus, why Nicodemus came to Jesus with this question about being born again in the dark, in the night, in need of that dark womb of new life. At least, maybe that's how it is for those who are willing to lift the veil. And so is it, is this good news or is it bad news? And I really think it's up to you and where you may be on any given day. I do know that there are real benefits to this kind of faith, though they may not appeal to those for whom God is only light and in whom there's no darkness at all. And I think the first benefit is that you have to slow way, way down once you enter the cloud. All those things you prided yourself on outside the cloud, your speed and your agility and your ability to, to suss things out at a single glance, they won't do you any good inside. You might as well crawl like a baby. At least you can't fall far when you're so close to the ground. The good news is that Slowness has a lot going for it. There's time to use senses you don't use when your eyes are working fine. There's, there's time to wonder where you think you're going and why. There's even time for the feelings you usually outrun to catch up with you. Tenderizing you in all the ways you have worked so hard to prevent. Another benefit is that none of your outside navigational tools can help you right now when you're in that cloud. Good luck with that compass or the laminated map or the, the guidebook or that Bible even. If, because if it's not inside you, when it's, it, then it's of limited use to you right now. And the good news is that Secondhand wisdom can only get you so far. Once you enter the cloud, it's time to find out what your primary resources are, what gyroscope, what tuning fork, uh, what insistent sacred whisper you can learn to trust when you're walking by faith and not by sight. And I think the third benefit is that you begin to see how shabby a faith based on benefits really is. Uh, inside the cloud, uh, with everything slowed way down. And I wonder if for James and Peter and John who were in that cloud today, if it seemed like time stood still when it slowed way down so that you are more in touch than you may want to be with whose cloud this is. The good news is that you can see very clearly how much of your life strategy has been designed to get you where you want to go and to get a handle on God while you're at it so that you can figure out how to get God to help you get there even faster. And I think this is more than a little embarrassing. It can break your heart so that you can hold the pieces in two hands when it's so dark you can't even see them and say, here, do absolutely anything with this broken heart that you want. And I know that will never sell. It's probably not going to be the most popular books. I know that. And darkenment. Is that even a word? It's never going to appeal like enlightenment does. Well, except, except maybe for the people who are already sitting in the dark, thinking they've done something wrong, that God has abandoned them, that they've lost their ways and may never find them again. To 
hear the gospel that God also dwells in darkness might save them right there on the spot. Along with any of us who might be listening in to that voice with our eyes focused on that cloud, because if we haven't already been there, we will be. By and by. No one who follows Jesus gets a rain check. No one who is human gets to bypass that dark cloud. But here's the thing about that cloud of unknowing, which even the saints take on trust. It's not there to get through like a fever or a test. It's God's home. It's the place where God dwells. And to be invited in is a great honor, and, and to stay a while, better yet. Those who come out can be hard to look at at first, like Moses. Where did all that brightness come from, inside that dark cloud? And they may not have a whole lot of words to describe where they've been. And maybe that's why Jesus told Peter and James and John not to talk about this cloud experience at least not yet. Even the limping ones will tell you this. They will never have chosen it, not in a million years. But now that it has happened, they never give it back. That time in the cloud. The morning after my father maneuvered our family car and trailer, through that dark cloud of fog, uh, the first night of camping. The next morning was an incredibly bright and sunny one. And my father pulled back the, the little curtains and the little window in the camper, and he said, you won't believe where we are. And each of us scrambled to the closest window and stared out at two very neat rows of parked airplanes. <laughs> we were camping on the end of a runway. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> the dark cloud can give way to a delightful and a surprising Shining God, you change us in ways we cannot imagine. You ask us to follow you, and something tells us that that can be a risky thing. But you show us the way to go. And you have a way of being with us when we need to pause, when we're not sure of the landmarks, when we're taken as disciples into the mist, into a new experience, and we're not sure what to make of it. And we are with you there in the brilliance and in the darkness, for it is all you. For there is no place that is not you. You send us out into your world, and as we climb and as we descend mountains today, Guide us in our next steps in proclaiming your amazing love. Amen.
Friends, thank you for letting me take my imagination where clouds take me. In the cloud, there are amazing, sometimes tough experiences for all of us. We learn and we are renovated and we go from those experiences to share our love that God gives to us with the world that God loves. And so may we do that this week. May we recognize, too, the face of Christ in the people we meet. And may the people we meet recognize the face of Christ 